a PDF version of the entire textbook. Yeah, yeah that, that may be that may be difficult to find though. I think someone in this chat. Oh, Garrett. Yes, there is audio. So yeah, so there should be, like Stanley says, there's definitely a digital copy of the book. I believe someone on here put up a link to a website that had a PDF. Oh, good, Garrett. So good. You can hear? Good. Um, I believe someone here put up a copy or a link to a website that had a PDF, a full PDF copy, pull a full PDF version of the textbook. So if you wanted in a PDF version, you could find it that way. I can't find, I can't find a PDF version of the particular article that I wanted to use tonight, and that is um, Peter Wolin. I know, write his name. Uh, that dude. So that's the reading for this week. And what I wanted to do was to break up into the groups and see if uh, some of the conversation could happen there, because it is, like I said, pretty straightforward. He makes a list. You get to chat about whether that but you know what that list means and, and uh, think about it a bit. And then we come back together and talk about it more specifically. So it seems as though, Charles, you do not have a copy of the textbook. Is that correct? Charles and Jalon, are you the two? Neither one of you have a copy? Oh, Charles, you have the book. Okay. Um, so does everyone else have a copy of the book? If so, then Jalon, you could follow along with the conversation and just kind of take notes and voice your opinion about ideas. Okay. So I haven't seen anybody who says they do not have a copy of the book outside of Jalon. And I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly, Jalon. Um, Sam or Samuel, you have just joined us. We are talking about whether we have copies of the textbook. Do you have a copy of the book? Okay, good, good. So it seems like most everyone uh, seems to have a copy. Well, where I, where I wanna start before we get into that portion, where I wanna start is um, to give you an idea of what in the world some of these people are talking about with some of the words they're using. Uh, these are words, some of these words are associated with psychology and a history of psychology. So if you have had a, a psychology class, you may have come across some of these words. Um, many of you may, even if you had had a psychology class, you may never have come across some of these terms. Garrett, you were the one who shared it. There you go. Okay. So, um, Jalon, and, and I don't know if this is a if this is a pay copy. I believe Garrett, you said it was. It was cheaper than what they had at the bookstore. But if Jalon, you are, yeah, that's definitely much cheaper than what you'll find at the bookstore. But if you are paying out of financial aid, then really the bookstore is your only option. Um, they, they will accept the financial aid payment and they just need to make sure they give you the book. Now, if you're paying out of the VA, I'm not sure how VA manages that. Um, but straight up financial aid would have to go through the bookstore. VA, you have to go through the um, bookstore. Unless the bookstore don't have it, then they'll do something different for you. Okay, so the VA works that way as well. Good. Um, okay, so and Jalon, if if that works for you, I mean, you don't have to purchase it right now, but if that works for you, then um, it certainly is much cheaper than what you would get uh, than what you would be asked to pay at the bookstore. Um, I encourage all of you, by the way, now that it's already done, but um, always consider renting your books unless you really think that you may want to hold on to it. Um, for some books. 
like my books in a, um, a humanities class I teach are all around $5 a piece. There's no sense in renting those. You just buy those. Um, but for these textbooks, which can run, you know, pretty expensive, the rental thing tends to be a pretty good option. The problem is, of course, you don't have the book after you're done with it. That can be a bit of a pain. Anyway, so let's talk about psychology. How does our mind work? Um, I'm going to assume that some of you know a little bit about psychology because you're all human beings with brains. <laughs> and so we all, we all know a little bit about psychology. We all know how we can uh, come to understand other people using our understanding of human beings and the human mind. We know that we can also use that understanding to manipulate people, of course. Now, none of you would ever do that. I understand that. But some human beings do that. And we also know that we, if, if we've ever been around children, um, we know how the mind develops to some extent. We know that it goes through certain stages. We know that um, there, are, there are still really mysterious aspects of the mind. For example, language learning. That's still to this day, a, a really poorly understood um, aspect of the mind, the young mind. How does it go through this process of suddenly absorbing an, almost an entire language and then just stop? So that if any of you have tried to learn a, a second language, you will know that it it's more difficult than what it was when you were a child, a kind of absorbing language. Uh, to learn a second language, you have to understand it somehow and then have application. And and it's a much more complicated, seemingly a much more complicated thing. So there are definite mysteries about how the brain works. There are There's a scientific community that's dedicated to a scientific um, experimental analysis of the biology of the brain and its resulting functioning. Um, you could call those cognitive scientists. And there's a scientific community that uh, seeks to understand less about the biology and more about the end result of the functioning of the brain. And you could call those the psychologists and to some extent the psychiatrist uh, community as well. Um, psychology itself is a science that is born. It doesn't just pop into existence with the beginning of science. It, it's, a, it's a late science. Um, so modern psychology goes back to the pre-Freud years of the middle of the 19th century. It is related to a history of categorization of different mental uh, differences. Um, it's related to a really cruel history of incarceration of the mentally different uh, in order to, quote unquote, cure them, uh, cure them. It's related to a history of also the incarceration of different sexual expressions. So um, homosexuality is defined as a, as a psychological concept in the 19th century as they are putting um, primarily men, but also women who engage in homosexual activity into asylums where they are generally treated pretty cruelly uh, for a large portion of the 19th century. And then it, it, it um, develops, it grows, and it turns into a much more uh, human science and less cruel to some extent. For most um, a theory, we could call theory of cinema, the grandfather of this movement is Freud. And if you've had a psychology class, you've all sat around and laughed at Freud and his silliness and there's, there's a lot of stuff to laugh about. But what I always try to remind people is that Freud, while yes, some of his um, uh, theory, especially later, becomes really kind of bizarre and almost silly, he is essential for uh, the development of the study of the brain as an objective thing. He is critical for the study of the mind as a functioning thing. So not only the brain and its biology, but the mind that develops from the functioning of the brain and its biology and trying to come to terms with it in a reasonable fashion. 
uh, rather than just tossing people who behave differently into a, a prison and letting them kind of rot. Um, he is also someone who is um, generally kind of responsible for removing some of the stigma related to certain forms of behavior, certain types of sexual behavior and non-sexual behavior in his exploration of the mind and breaking down the very uh, narrow construct of what we would call normal, quote unquote, breaking down its narrowness and expanding it uh, to include different forms of normal, quote unquote, would also be something that fits under under Freud and his and his students. So yes, there's lots to laugh at, but we really wouldn't have a lot of our understanding of the mind uh, if it weren't for Freud and his students and then the eventual sort of growth of this entire movement into what is now the biological analysis of the mind and the brain. The other name on here, you probably have never come across until you started reading some of these things like Daniel Dayen. Uh, and, and that's because Lacan is uh, not a foundational member of psychology, but he was, he and his writing, just like Freud and his writing, were very, very important for both those who wrote literature and created art and for those who studied literature and art and, as it turns out, cinema. Uh, so their thoughts about especially how we process the world around us become very influential in trying to understand how the audience processes things on the screen and why cinema can be so addictive and why the visual in general can be so addictive and what do we what do we get out of it and how do we get that out of it those are um, the things that the writing of Lacan who himself didn't really study cinema all that much but his writing um, about language and uh, psychology become influential on those who study uh, who study cinema and study um, other narratives. So let's dive into it. And so the, the title of this thing, of my little lecture here, is Psychology of Cinema. And that's generally what we're talking about, is what is the psychology that makes cinema somehow attractive to us? What, what attracts us to it? Now, of course, all of us on this list will say, well, entertainment. I mean, I want to be entertained. I want to, I want to have fun when I go and watch a movie. And it has to conform in certain ways to my expectations that I had when I went into the movie. Uh, and that's all fine and dandy. But those who, who study cinema, and especially those who study it from the point of view of Lacan, would turn around and say, so why do you enjoy it? What is there that is enjoy, enjoyable about you know, watching people be decapitated. What is there in, that's enjoyable about watching a heroic figure um, have problems in their lives and then turn around and, and defeat the enemy in spite of the things that were oriented against them in this great battle at the end? I mean, what is it that makes that attractive? Why, why is it that we are attractive to it? And more importantly, is there something in there that... that um, while, while entertainment is good, is there something in the way that we look at cinema and our own entertainment that we might say, entertainment is fine up to a point, but eventually there has to be, you can't immerse yourself as a, as a good, fine, upstanding member of society. It's, um, it's not a good thing to immerse yourself in something that is so addictive and... Um, and all-encompassing, and so that you think that the world works that particular way. This particular slide is about how psychology and cinema kind of link together in certain ways. So the intro that I've given you is that first bullet. There are, it, this, this entire movement of psychology has been very, very influential on the um, study of cinema on film theorists um, from, and this goes way, way, way back. You can even see remnants of this in 
uh, Eisenstein's writing, and he's writing close to the to the birth of cinema as a, as a thing. There is a question about how is it that we process stuff? How is it that we understand things? How is it that we know when we see the face of a character and then we see an object and then we see the face again that that character is looking at that object? So there is something about our minds that is there for us to understand. What is it that allows us to get past the idea of having a close-up and all of a sudden being confronted with the actual face of the person when that is not a literal possibility, unless we suddenly leapt across a room and put our face right into someone else's face, which in the time of COVID-19, we will never be able to do until we have the vaccine. So all the way back to the very beginning of writing and cinema, there is a question about how does this work? And there are two different routes for, for asking this question. There's Eisenstein's route for determining what makes the best and most impactful narrative. The structural or the, um, that's a bad word because that comes up later, the, the, um, the aesthetic, the practical aesthetic question. That's Eisenstein's concern. How do I put movies together to have a certain impact? And then there's the other concern, which is more philosophical, and that is um, how do we process this? And does it do something to us in that processing? Or how do we are we learning something from it, or are we um, slipping into some state of perfection in order to get past all of those little kind of contradictions or juxtapositions that we see? So I've given you some key assumptions here too, and and these are important to remember in all of the reading that. The one of the key assumptions is from for most everyone who's writing about the cinema is that we perceive the world through a filter. And so that we are not direct our mind is not directly connected to the real world that's around us. It's always mediating the world. And I have here some examples, right? So our eyes receive information. Um through the form of light that gets transmitted into nerve impulses, we could call them, that go to our brain, which then deciphers what it is that our eye has seen. Um, so there's, a, there's something mediating it. There's something between me or, or where my concept of myself resides, which is my brain, and that outside world that I'm looking at. And that's, that would be our nerves, the same with touching. But something that you may not think about is time dilation. And I'm not talking about in the absolute, you know, sense of, of um, Interstellar, a very fun movie to watch and interesting, wonderful science fiction. I'm not talking about that type of time dilation, you know, a literal physical uh, uh, time of in the movie, and I mean, I'm sorry, time in the universe being stretched or bent or or contorted in the way that it happens when you're closer to massive um, gravity, etc. I'm talking about the idea of sitting down and all of a sudden realizing that 30 minutes have gone past, and you just you're just kind of you know daydreaming or whatever, or um, being trapped in a lecture and feeling as though infinity has passed <laughs> uh, as the professor like me drones on and blah, blah, blah. Those are types of dilation of our experience of something that is concrete out in the world. So time is concrete. It's, it's specific. It's out there. It moves whether I want it to or not. But my experience of it varies so that sometimes it feels longer, sometimes it feels shorter, etc. So that already indicates that time is out there in the world, but my experience of it separates me off from the actual reality that's, that's out there. And so a lot of this is, by the way, talking about the experiences of the things that are in the world. And of course, memories also affect it. So memories color our information about the world, uh, memories and emotions. And um, this is a very important concept in a lot of literature at the turn of the century, literature that was being written at the same time as cinema was being invented, by the way, um, at the turn of the century that, uh, that played on this idea of the memory being able to, to 
um, stretch out time so that you felt like it was longer, but also how your memories and your emotions filter the information that's coming into you, even if it's visual information. You know, we um, there's plenty of studies about eyewitness accounts and how the emotional state of the person who's having the eyewitness account can color the information that they remember, um, their own history, uh, their own uh, traumas in their past can color quite strongly the information that they eyewitness. And I think there was a um, wonderful, quick, and, and non-scientific study of a uh, of someone at, at Harvard who had who had someone come in and steal his bag off of his desk as he was lecturing, and then you know run out the room. And this person was sitting in the room for the first half of the lecture and then jumped up and grabbed the bag and ran off. And he checked everyone in the room get, looking for an eyewitness account. And the amount of variation on the description of this person, including the color of their skin, uh, they weren't wearing anything to cover up their skin, was absolute. I mean, no one had a very consistent, uh, very consistent eyewitness information to give about this person. And what the deeper study suggested was that it was both, there was there was all sorts of different inputs from themselves and from outside that were coloring what it was that they were remembering about this particular event. So that too is an indication of our, our separation from the real world around us. We experience the world, but we're not, we're not there in the world. And that is a key assumption in all the reading that you're going to be doing is that kind of distance between from us and the, the real thing that's out there. Now, any, um, any film theory also has to take into account that cinema is a unique type of art that has a time limit, speaking of time. So um, some of these, some of the articles, actually, I don't, I don't know that any of the articles that we, well, no, Walter Benjamin brings this up, I believe, that there is a, there's a restrictive kind of, um, I don't want to use the word fascist, but but very authoritarian an idea of cinema as well. You have to follow at the pace that the movie gives for you. You, you don't have the luxury in the theater of flipping a page back a couple of, you know, a couple of pages to figure out what happened. And who's this character that suddenly popped up in this Russian novel? Man, he mentioned this guy. 20 pages ago, and I'm supposed to remember all these complicated names, so I got to flip back. Uh, okay, th so there he is. Oh, that's who this guy is. Can't do that in the cinema. So there's a there's kind of an authoritarian pulling of you that happens in the movie narrative that doesn't happen in any of the other narratives that we experience. Unless, of course, we talk about the theater, which does have a particular pace that you have to follow as well. So... Now, if you have any questions or any um, comments that you want to bring up at any point, feel free, interrupt me or type them into the chat if you want. So the, the other assumption here is that our perception of the world is fundamentally psychological and therefore is influenced by things that are psychological. Things like ideology, memory, as I've mentioned already, traditions, expectations, concepts, etc. So when we talk about the monster movie later, when we get to Alien, you'll, you'll read something by a woman by the name of Linda Williams, and she brings up the fact that there is a type of strange, perverse effeminacy in a lot of the early monsters, and they're, they're kind of androgynous or leaning towards the effeminate, but in the male body. And that what those uh, monsters may be pulling on is the cultural fear of those um, sort of gender non-binaries that influenced uh, the depiction of these monsters. And of course, propagate this notion of that type of behavior as being, you know, um, or that type of life or that type of whatever is being somehow, quote unquote, perverted. Sorry if you hear my dog barking. I don't know why she's barking. She's a crazy dog. Anyway, so, and then another assumption is that narrative has these deeply psychological features uh, that seem to point towards universals. And if you get into a class where, in an English class, um, quite often 
where you talk about um, narrative and narratology, you're going to be introduced to these concepts such as the monomyth, uh, a hero narrative, and how seemingly universal the aspects of these narratives are and aspects of the hero story are. It, it's as though they kind of pop up all over the place in different cultures, not just in European culture, but in um, even in African folk tales and in Chinese fairy tales, this mono myth, as it's called, or this this type of narrative that has a particular path that is taken by the hero, seems to be a universal fo um, um, aspect of storytelling. Another um, type of concept here that's going to pop up later when we talk about Freud is sublimation. And that is the idea of turning your own desires towards something that is acceptable. Uh, and then, of course, power structures are also important that are part of psychology, but are also a part of the real world. They're, they're actually you know out there. You don't imagine that there are power structures in the world. They, they are really there, even though they are, by their nature, somewhat fictional. So These are all, by the way, all of these slides are, if you have a, a new version of, um, what's it called, PowerPoint, there's this little portion where you can do, you know, a suggested slide uh, art or something. And so I just clicked on that and it resonated so well, uh, it was kind of funny. So here we're talking about Freud, which talks a lot about the biological body and here, and what do you know, the little recommended picture was this little skeletal man, who I like, actually. I think he's pretty cool. And he's going to appear later, too. Sorry. Anyway, so let's talk about Freud. As I said, if you have had a class in psychology, you've probably come across Freud. You probably have at him a little bit. It's natural. Um, but you can't really understand film theory without understanding some of the Freudian concepts that persist in film theory. Whether you think that they are right or wrong, you have to kind of put that to the side a little bit until you do a deeper analysis of Freud's, of Freud's model and his theory and his philosophy and how that integrates with, um, a, the, with the film theory that you're reading. Um, so you have to kind of put it to the side and try to just gr grapple with what it is that they're trying to say. And so, which, by the way, um, I, I don't want you to think that every single one of these articles that you're going to be reading, you have to agree with. That's not the point of reading in a college level. These are things that you negotiate with, that you accept as being something that has been written on cinema that is important, but that you don't necessarily say this person has written the absolute truth about this particular topic. Instead, it's just a you know jumping off point for you to grapple with it, negotiate, and, and try to figure out a way forward in your own understanding of the cinema. So um, some general Freudian things that you're going to read over and over again is something like perception as is and how it's connected to this process of sublimation of our sexual desire. And that takes a little bit of explanation. Um, so right at the turn of the century, Freud publishes a, um, a work called Three Essays on uh, the Theory of Sexuality. And he puts all of our desires into this container that are, are connected to our sexual drives. Um, and his suggestion is, and he, he's not making this up whole cloth. He's borrowing from a lot of different research that has gone into the mind and its relationship to sexuality up to this point. He does a number of very important things in these, in these books, uh, including um, getting rid of some of the stigma about quote unquote perversions in uh, sexual behavior, et cetera. Um, but some of the more important theoretical things that he does is to suggest uh, this model of the mind, which is the Freudian model of the mind, which is something you may be familiar with. And that is this kind of um, conglomerate of these three different things one of them being um, 
the ego, which is the part of your mind that thinks about you as a, as a subject, as a single person. The superego, which is the part of your mind that is both conscious and subconscious, that thinks about what your parents would say is right or wrong. It's oftentimes called the the um, uncon. What are they? The, the something parent. I can't remember what it's called. It's sort of like the little Jiminy Cricket in Pinocchio, who sits on the on your shoulder and always says, "You shouldn't do that. You shouldn't do that. You shouldn't do that." And there are various reasons for this. Some of them go back to the father or the or the the family telling you you should not do that particular thing. It's bad for you. Um, and I think that. An old-fashioned concept of masturbation, I, not to be uncomfortable <laughs> here, but there's an old concept of masturbation that says, you know, you 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 should prevent your student your students. <laughs> Sorry about that. You should prevent your children from doing it because it's dirty. It can lead to all sorts of diseases. Uh, it's it it's crude, um, etc. We're in a much more uh, in a different society now, which is much more accepting of it as a childhood type of behavior. But that wasn't the case at the turn of the century. And um, so that puts Freud into a position of saying that this kind of seeming, the seemingly natural idea, the seemingly natural thing, which all children go through, um, being repressed, being forced to stay down in your subconscious leads to anxiety and fears and other things. And that's the other level, uh, or that's where another of these levels is. So I've mentioned the ego, the super ego is that parent who's telling you it's right or wrong. And then deep, deep down in the subconscious is this thing he calls the id. The word is id, id, literally. That's the only letters there in it. Um, this part is a drive. It is an animal-like drive that doesn't really have a specific object at all. It just desires things. It just wants things. And what Freud says is, for that second bullet, we are evolved and our minds have evolved. But down deep inside of our mind is an animal that has animal-like drives. This isn't unique to Freud. Freud is um, coming along something that's already been pre presented uh, effectively that we have two. So pre-Freud, the, the suggestion was we have two fundamental drives inside of us. The drive to copulate and reproduce and the drive to preserve our own lives, so eating and drinking. And they are both oriented towards the preservation of either ourselves uh, or of our community, our timeline, I mean, our, our, you know, our genetic structure, right? But what Freud says is, okay, so those drives are in there, that's fine, but those are animal drives and we are not animals. We are, we are evolved from those lower animals. And so what happens to those types of drive is they get, they get changed in some way. They get changed into something that's more complicated. And that is what is called sublimation or a redirection. And so these drives, these fundamental drives that are inside of us, pushing us towards copulation and, and, you know, preservation of ourselves, those aren't doing that uh, because we're in a society where we don't have to worry about that that much at any rate. We don't have to worry about, um, you know, uh, the needs that we would if we were in the animal life in, in the wild. And moreover, they can be destructive, right? So if we're all after the same small amount of food, uh, or we're all attacking each other, or you know, we enter into a COVID-19 crisis and everybody runs to the grocery store and buys up every single thing they can, and you see other people who are, who are looking at them saying, well, my family needs food too, and you all start attacking each other. 
those are the way those drives emerge in an unstable environment. And he's assuming that we have roughly a stable environment and that those drives have to be redirected. And they get redirected in very positive ways. So from Freud's point of view, we play, we have entertainment, in other words, we work, and we take pleasure in all sorts of non-sexual activities as a redirection of that fundamental sexual drive that is about reproduction. And if you think about it, play is a type of reproduction. You're creating something. Work is a type of reproduction. You're creating something. Um, a whole bunch of other things that we do, active sporting events and stuff like that. You're, you're creating something in that you're creating an end result, right? You're creating a, um, a score on a, on a, um, on a scoreboard, which is a type of creation. You're, you're carving your name into history, even if it's just local history by being a part of that sporting event. And so this idea of preservation of yourself and the species is sublimated and turned towards things that are more than just sexual activity. Something else that happens in this process, though, is that the act of copulation also becomes kind of sublimated. And so other aspects of the human body become sexualized as a, as a redirection of the simplicity of, copy, of copulation, that, that raw drive. And that's a very important concept that figures into a number of the writers you're going to be reading, is that idea of the sexual drives being redirected towards something else. Because one of the terms that you're going to you're going to see over and over again is scopophilia, which is the love of looking at things. And this comes, this is one of these complicated things in Freud. It's not a very simple thing, but one aspect of it is that you take pleasure in looking at things as a redirection of those sexual drives. So we take pleasure in looking at a movie as a redirection of those uh, sexual drives. Now into this too is another, another concept that's right here, castration anxiety, which I leapt over. This is mentioned in an article you're gonna be reading soon by Laura Mulvey. Uh, and it's, it's again important to remember that most of the history of Europe is a it's a very restrictive patriarchal order and that we still live in a type of patriarchal order because there's still a a, a concept that uh, men are more powerful and have more power and and they do have more power they have more economic power they they have more um, uh, you know more power in, in a number of different ways. And so we're still kind of in this remnants of this patriarchal order, which is delimiting to women and the ability for women to do certain uh, do certain jobs or do uh, certain uh, to to live off of their art or et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It's, it's still a fairly complicated patriarchal order that we have, and that core to this patriarchal order is a concept called castration anxiety so that um, there is a generalized anxiety in all men, according to Freud, of being emasculated, of being emasculated both literally and figuratively. So there's a generalized anxiety of having all of your power taken away. Um, and this is associated with women because women in a patriarchal order, have no power. They have their power taken away, and they also don't have a phallus. They don't have a penis. So there's, a, there's kind of a, in, in Freud's mind, there's kind of a natural correlation between the image of the woman who, who just so happens to have no power in the patriarchy and the fact that she doesn't have a penis, and that gets connected to the idea that the penis or the phallus is the symbol, is the one thing that keeps the man in the dominant order and so that creates this generalized castration anxiety, which Laura Mulvey is going to pull in as being a core relationship concept in the relationship between men and women in society. Now, she is writing in the 1970s, and we have 
moved leaps and bounds beyond the 1970s when it comes to women in the workplace and women in uh, society having much more power. The 1970s, that was only just beginning, really. So you have to remember that as a context for when she's writing. But um, another a final idea or a final notion about Freud that is important is that these subconscious anxieties, like the castration anxiety, these subconscious um, complexes, like the Oedipal complex, uh, get dealt with in the subconscious through dreaming. And so dream analysis is a very important component of Freud's model of how to analyze someone's mind so that you can help with their anxieties and their um, disabilities, etc. Mental uh, you know, disabilities. So the idea of Freud analyzing dreams and the metaphorical concept of cinema being like a dream theater is not accidental. And that's foundational to a lot of these articles that you're going to be reading. They're implicitly linking these two things together. Being in the cinema is a bit like dreaming. Um, it's not exactly, but it's a bit like that. So let's move on to Mr. Lacan. Now, Lacan is the one that you'll have to deal with a little bit more in anything that you read about cinema. And if you, you know, if you ever pick up a copy of anything by this man by the name of Slavoj Žižek, who's you know really popular right now for some strange reason, um, anything written by him is going to deal with Lacan. Uh, and he he does mention Freud, but everything goes back to Lacan. Lacan was a a student of Freud, or, or a student of his psychology. I'm not sure that he was a student of Freud himself, but of Freudian psychology. But what he did was he modified Freudian psychology quite extensively and established his own uh, sort of theoretical approach to psychology, which is now called Lacanian psychology. Uh, and that's what you see here. Uh, and there are three components of the mind or the psyche in Lacanian psychology. There is the real, the symbolic, and the imaginary. These are not in competition with the id, the ego, and the uh, superego in Freud. They're not in competition with Freud's concept of the conscious and the subconscious or the unconscious. They are mapped onto that model, though they, they do kind of modify it a bit. So Lacan still does see the id as being inside of our minds driving us forward, but he does, he does change it a bit. Um, so, uh, but generally speaking, much of Freudian psychology is modified by Lacan. They resonate with each other, but there are some clear, distinct differences. But let's look at the resonances, and let's just map out what Lacan is talking about. One is the real, and notice I have the little body here again. That's another one that popped up, the little skeleton guy, because the real is like the biology of the body. It's, um, it's a part of nature that we don't have unmediated access to. We can never be at one with nature or at one with the real. I mean, until we die, I guess, and our body decomposes, and then sure, we're at one with the real, with the, with the real but our mind isn't, because one would assume that the mind either goes into some heaven, if you believe in that, or it just kind of disappears. That's it. Either way, we don't have access to that real nature that's around us, and that's what the real is. So we only, back to that, that core point earlier, we only know the world through mediation. We don't know it directly. And so this state of nature, this state of being close to nature, is where we are as a newborn baby. We're still separated off from it, but we are as close to being 
animal nature as we will most likely ever be. He calls this place, this order, the place of pure need. So as I have here, it's a little bit equivalent to what Freud is talking about with the id. This place of pure need. The difference for Lacan is he sees the mind taking stages and modifying um, a bit more flexibly than what Freud saw. So everything that happens to uh, us as a child in Freud, it stays inside of us. Lacan would see it as us having to negotiate with that and incorporating it into ourselves, but, but modifying it at the same time. And that's kind of what happens with the state of need. We begin as babies just needing stuff. We don't think about the need. At least we don't think that we think about the need. We don't really know what's happening in a baby's uh, baby's mind, but uh, it seems as though it's just a need. I just need this. Um, we don't have language as babies, that we know, because from from um, Lacan's point of view, we have not entered into the symbolic. Um, we'll get to that in just a minute. The real, as he was fond of saying, is impossible. And what that really means is that we can't say what the real is because as soon as we attempt to say what the real is, we have to use language and using language means that we're not in the real, we're in the symbolic. And so it, it's simply impossible. <laughs> it, you, you, there's no way of describing it. There's no way of, of interacting with it. There's no way of confronting it. It's, it is impossible. Um, and as I have here the last point, our material existence, our biological existence is the real. Freud is not, I mean, I'm sorry, Lacan is not pretending as though we don't have actual bodies that still have needs, by the way, and that we don't have, you know, there's not a biological reality to us. It's not all some sort of idealistic you know, kind of notion of us floating around in our minds. It is, you know, the real body is there, and that real body is, the, um, is part of the real, is connected to it. But let's move on. So the symbolic is a bit, possibly a bit easier to understand. The symbolic is the order of language. Language for Lacan is symbol, it's symbolic. And we can see that by thinking about the word cat. I may have done this little thing already in this class, but I'll do it again. If you th think about the word cat, well, all of you are going to picture a cat probably in your head, and most likely each one of you will pitch picture a different cat in your head that will look different. But the word cat connects all of these things symbolically. That cat that you are thinking about may exist in the real world in front of you. You may have a pet cat. But that cat, that pet cat of yours, is connected to the pet cat that I don't have in my mind, because I don't have cats, by this word. So the word cat becomes a symbol that connects these two things. So anything having to do with language, visual language, uh, gesticulation, so if you gesture, if you point at something, all of these are symbolic acts, and they are what Lacan calls the symbolic order. This is, of course, the order that narrative is in. So if you tell a story, it's a symbolic order. It's part of the symbolic order because it's part of language. But it's also the order of law, traditions, and ideology. Now, he calls this the name of the father, and, and this is where it gets very Freudian feeling, that we have to accept the father's or patriarchy's restrictions on us and our language, and that that is part of this symbolic order. It always already... It's a you know, wonderful little philosophical expression. But basically, 
always we are restricted in the symbolic order and our own restrictions are carved into the symbolic order as the way we interact with the world around us. And so we craft our own restrictions and our own limitations and our own barriers by using language itself. No matter how free we would like to believe ourselves to be in our speech, we are always limited in our speech because it is part of a symbolic order. It's it's always a barrier. It's always a limitation. Um, but importantly, language is, as again, to quote from Lacan, language is the pact which links us together in one action in society. So we can't have a society, according to Lacan, without language. Therefore, society itself is symbolic. It's part of the symbolic order. And it's how we enter into the real world, uh, as what we would think of as the real world, the world of interactions, of social interaction, of, of caring for each other, of being a member of society or a member of a family or a member of a religion. They're all connected symbolically. And we are all connected symbolically through, through language or through this order of language. He calls the symbolic order as the order of desire. So we transition out of the order of need, where we just have raw need, and eventually we transition into the order of desire. But in between the two of them is the order of demand, and that is the imaginary. So you could think about these as stages. So the first stage is that stage of need or the stage of being close to the real. The second stage is the stage of the imaginary or the point at which we learn that we are objects in a society or in a world. Um, this is what the mirror stage is. The mirror stage is a very, very famous stage in Lacan's theory. You will see it over and over and over again in film theory. So it's a good idea to have a little bit of an understanding of what's what's going on with this. The mirror stage is also something that I think is really fairly understandable. I, I mean it's um it's kind of it's kind of it it means something uh, because we can actually see this in babies. We can see this in children. So if you have if you have children, you actually know that this uh, this thing exists. I get the feeling that I have spoken about this already, and so my apologies if I'm running over territory that we've we've already spoken about. But but at any rate, um, the mirror stage is the stage where uh, the baby comes to understand itself, and and the actual physical experiment that you can do with your own children. This is where I think I've mentioned this already. Is if you put a dot on a baby's forehead and you show them a mirror, if they even recognize the baby in the mirror, they kind of pay attention to it. Some babies won't. It, there's a stage to getting to that too. Uh, they will think that the dot is on the forehead of the baby in the mirror. They will not think of it as themselves. And so they'll reach up and they'll try to scrape it off of the baby in the mirror. But at some point, all of a the sudden, there's a stage they shift into. And the mind, the, the baby, the subject, whatever you want to call them, begins to realize that the dot on the forehead is on their own forehead because they see that the baby in the mirror is themselves. Now, for Lacan, this stage is very important because it does some things psychologically. It's, that, it's at this point that um, we transition out of that order of need and into the order of demand. It's at this point that the ego, the concept of the I, I do this, I want this, formulates inside of the child, even though it doesn't have a word for that. It just begins to comprehend it. It won't have a word for that until it learns language, um, or it, whether that's verbal language or 
sign language and um, and then begins to demand the satisfaction of its desires. That's the, this is the order of demands. But it also is associated with the fantasy self. And this is where it becomes so fascinating for film theorists that the fantasy self develops in the mirror stage as something that is complete and whole and put together and not splintered and fractured and difficult to comprehend like we are. So what happens is from Lacan's point of view, we are confronted by something that looks complete and whole, but then we feel ourselves as being scattered and incomplete and fractured. And we know that what we see in the mirror is ourselves. And so that creates anxieties. That creates a desire to be that complete and perfect whole person that's in the mirror. And that also determines how we have relationships with other people. We seek the ideal self, an ideal that is complete and whole and perfect. And we want to identify with that. And that's how we have heroes. That's how we have lovers. That's how love affairs fall apart. If you know the, the lover is found out to be less than perfect, then the love affair falls apart. This is related to concepts like narcissism. The more you identify with the image in the mirror, the more narcissistic you are, according to Lacanian psychology, meaning the more that you love yourself and you think yourself is so perfect, um, and the more you will seek that type of um, perfection in others. But it, it is a the fracturing that we feel of ourselves that actually sets the stage for us to be able to think of something over there as perfect. And, and for film theorists, this explains the star system perfectly. It, it is the explanation for the star system. We want images of actors who are whole and complete and not broken and, and not flawed. Uh, we want to see those images. We want to believe in those images, just like we want to believe that we can achieve a type of wholeness and perfection like we saw in the mirror when we first began to understand ourselves as a distinct subject. So the final thing here is that the image, the imaginary and the symbolic, these two orders, operate in tension to create what we perceive to be reality. And that means that we still have the imaginary inside of us. Um, that's what leads some of the writers, I think Dayan mentions this, that because the imaginary is still an order in, in which we exist, the, um, the, the, images that we see in the cinema, the, those images that we that we uh, fall in love with effectively, are images that connect somehow with this imaginary self that we have inside of us, this imaginary um, part of our psyche, the psyche that is linked to the imaginary order. But at the same time, we also have this confrontation of the symbolic order and if you you can use that lens to look at a lot of the dynamic um, narratives, a lot of the dynamism that happens in narratives in uh, especially Hollywood cinema, to talk about how those narratives create tension, et cetera. So um, hang on one second. I'll be right back. So that is the, that's the Lacanian and Freudian stuff for you that'll help you a little bit when it comes to some of that reading. Um, and this is time for you to ask questions if you have them. Otherwise, what we'll do is we'll take a few minutes, take a break so I can stand up and stretch my legs a little bit. Um, and then we'll come back and we'll try to wrangle some Peter Woolen and also talk a little bit about floating weeds.
Garrett, I could see this being, yes, something that you could use for uh, an analysis of Sunset Boulevard, something that you can use to understand that strange relationship the two of them have, but also the relationship that they have to Hollywood, which is the the producer of dreams as much as it is the producer of the star system, for sure. Okay, so sounds like you're 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 meditating upon it, and that's fine. Um, what we'll do is we'll go ahead and take five minutes. So we'll come back around six forty, six forty one, um, and then we'll maybe do the breakout sessions and um, then do a little bit. We'll spend thirty minutes doing that. Talk about Peter Wollen a little bit, uh, and then maybe uh, look at some of the scenes from Floating Weeds. Unfortunately, I don't have the copy of Sunset Boulevard to do any analysis of that, but we can at least look at some of the scenes in Floating Weeds. So I'll see you in about five minutes. I'm going to mute your, my mic, but if you want to chat amongst yourselves, chat away. <laughs> 
Okay. Dear students, what um, what I wanted to do now is to, to break out into the rooms to hello again, to um, chat about Peter Wolin. And let me give you the uh, page number here. If you have the eighth edition of the book, if you have the eighth edition, Peter Wolin is on page 365. 365. So I'm going to split you up randomly into, uh, into your little individual rooms. I think I'll just do two rooms. There's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Yeah, that'll be two rooms of four. And give you 30 minutes. And yes, it's going to, it's going to kick you out. Right at 30 minutes, sharply, you'll be just ended. <laughs> uh, so so it, it will be a bit brutal. But grab your text. Even if you haven't read it, it's perfectly acceptable. Um, pull out, I mean, the, the article begins with the list of what he calls um, criteria or ideas or, or things that are related to Hollywood cinema or mainstream cinema and things that are related to um, what he calls counter cinema, which would be where Godard would fit for him, and just chat about those things that are on the list and what you think uh, they mean, read a little bit about what you think they mean or, or what he says that they mean, try to come up with some examples that you can think of, and then we'll come back together in the room with each other. All right? And my... Puppy is barking loudly again. All right, here we go. Ciao. Peter Wollen, yes, Peter Wollen. Have the seventh edition. It's Peter Wollen. Uh, hang on. The name, Justin, if you're still here, the name is... Bon. Dest, or the title also has counter cinema in it. I can't think of the exact title. Don't know the page numbers, but they're going to be pretty close to what's in the eighth edition, too. Charles, you should have gotten the invite. the only person yeah, in this go. conference. You are currently the only person in this conference. <laughs> 
I think that in June, I think in June, we're going to have, we're going we're to be able to get to our offices. I don't think we're going to be teaching any classes there. We'll be able to just, well, with a mask on, walk in freely and both to our offices. You are currently You are currently the only person in this conference.
You are currently the only person in You are currently the only person in this conference. You are currently the only person in this conference. <laughs> 
You are currently the only person in this conference.
You are currently the only person in this conference.
Doop, boop, boop. Welcome back, everyone. Uh, a quite brutal transition transition as normal. Hello, hello. Hello. I'm going to use that for my friends. It's like, oh, you got to kick the click. Oh, my bad. <laughs> <laughs> Sup, dudes and dudettes. Yes, I agree. So I know there was quite a bit of discussion about the two, and I and I said yes. Feel free to talk about the uh, the movie. I mean, especially if you haven't read very closely um, Peter Wolland. But what I want to do is kind of give you a, a quick summary of what's up with Peter Wolland, and stick to the promise I made at the beginning of the semester not to go until eight fifty. Uh, it's not my plan. So, and I did see some good good conversation about Peter Wolland. Um, I think that a number of you caught on to the idea of narrative transitivity and narrative intransitivity. I want to uh, clarify that a little bit by giving you kind of a kind of an idea of films that you may have seen. So, um, so pretty much any of the films that you have seen will have had narrative transit uh, transitivity, meaning that. The movie begins in one place. There's a logical chain of events that lead you up to the end of the movie, where if it's a thriller or a mystery, the mystery or the killer is revealed. If it's a love story, then the two lovers come together. And, and you knew that was going to happen when you started watching the movie anywhere, anyway. They end up, you know, together on a building at the end or some something like that. Um, but even if the ending is not necessarily something that you would have predicted, it still has a logical flow that you are following in the film. That's the purpose, you would say, of the film, of the narrative. The opposite of that, narrative intransitivity, is probably films that you wouldn't have seen. And, and none of the films that we have seen up to this point really have this narrative intransitivity. And actually... It's going to be much later before we get to some that you could say have, you know, real specific uh, examples of narrative intransitivity. But the um, uh, uh, the ideas that Peter Wollen throws at us are things like episodic construction. So you'll have an episode of something that happens related between two characters and then um, fade to black and then you'll have another episode that shows maybe two different characters or a different um, or one character and, and other characters. And then their conversation may have nothing to do with what had happened to begin with, you know, what had happened in the earlier scene. Um, he says undigested digression, which really means, uh, well, to be honest, for some of these, you'd really have to watch a Godard film that isn't breathless. So you'd have to pick up, um, you know, watch The Weeknd or, um, well, any of the many of his other films to see some of these, some of these examples. And they are quite disruptive. They're, they, it doesn't feel as though the narrative is moving at all. It doesn't feel as though there is a narrative. You get little snippets of a narrative and then the narrative will change to a completely different topic. And you can feel a bit lost. Uh, wandering through these uh, crazy stories of Godard. But um, this style has been somewhat influential. So if you think of Memento, um, what's his name's not first movie, but I think it's technically his second movie, but it's first big hit. Uh, the guy who did The Dark Knight, same director. Um, and the guy who did Interstellar. Oh, shoot, why can I not think of his name? Well, that guy. And Memento, if you haven't seen Memento yet, Peter Nolan, thank you. I'm sorry, not Peter Nolan, Christopher Nolan. Peter Nolan, I think, is his brother. Christopher Nolan. Yep. Um, it is close enough, yes. So Christopher Nolan is someone in Memento who did 
be bend the rules quite significantly when it comes to this concept of narrative transitivity so that the entire story kind of plays out backwards uh, from the end of the narrative back to the beginning of the narrative. And now by the end of the movie, you see that there has been a type of logic that's glued things together. So it doesn't really perfectly fit. That would be one of the closest ones that some of you may have seen. So let's move to the other one. Identification for versus estrangement is a much easier concept. And this is something we're going to come back to over and over again in a number of the films. Characters are designed for you to identify with them. They're given, you're given a little bit of their story. You're given a particular social class or, or an emotion that they have so that you identify with that emotion, with that thought, so that you effectively work your way into the brains of these characters and you live almost their experiences. This is a standard uh, screenwriting 101 type concept. You have to create characters that people feel that they, that they live through and that they identify with. What um, Wallen suggests for this counter mainstream cinema or a cinema that would not be so mainstream, that would be more artistic and would break up um, these, it, it would break up our expectations of the film is something called estrangement. Uh, and he uses the example of direct address. Well, you probably many of you have probably seen a film that uses direct address. And yet that technique in and of itself wasn't enough for you to not identify with the character. Though it does play around with your process of identifying with this character. And of course, the movie I'm talking about is does anybody know? It's a superhero movie, a Marvel movie. No, no, not Spider-Man. It's not the one I'm thinking about. Yeah, a Marvel movie has direct address. Someone talks to you in the movie, talks to the camera, and makes a whole game of talking to the camera. Yes, Deadpool, exactly. So Deadpool is an example that uses, that's a, that's a narrative, that's a film that uses this concept to, and it does change your relationship to that character. It's a much different relationship than you have with Spider-Man or any of the others who don't talk directly to you. Um, now, whether that's a pro whether that's really this idea of estrangement like uh, Peter Wollen means, I don't know about that because the real purpose, the real purpose of this concept of estrangement is for us to step away from the narrative and look at it more abstractly, more as a work of art, rather than being involved in the narrative and feeling the emotions. But I think that we could say that Deadpool, by talking to the camera and by having this, this game sort of, um, changes the hero, hurt, missing his lover uh, type narrative that is ingrained in so many different superhero movies, for example, Spider-Man, so that we feel the story of Spider-Man. Oh, you know, he can't be with uh, so-and-so. What's her name? Mary something. I don't know. He can't be Mary Jane. Yeah. And, you know, blah, blah, blah. And, then, and sometimes she knows. Sometimes Anyway, and the comic books do it differently, of course. But then when we see Deadpool in a pretty much effectively the same relationship, right? He can't be with his woman because he's all scarred, blah, blah, blah. Um he turns it into this strange comedy and therefore makes the the story very superficial and very comedic rather than um, emotional and dramatic. So they use the technique and the end result is something that is distinctly different from your standard uh, your standard Hollywood film. Feels more human. Yeah, you you do identify with the character more in a, but in a different way. So you're not you're not feeling the feelings of the character. You're really kind of connecting with him almost like he's a friend of yours. Um, and that is the purpose of the filmmakers to have that quips and have all of that, um, that wonderful dialogue, et cetera. So the next one is transparency versus foregrounding. Again, this is not something you're going to see very often in mainstream filmmaking. 
But uh, transparency is what you will see. Every single film that you probably have been subjected to has been a film that is transparent. There is nothing in the film that calls attention to itself as a movie. Other than perhaps Deadpool looking at the camera as though it's almost like, you know, um, a crew of cameramen following him around everywhere. So there are moments in that film where you get a sense of there being a breakage with your standard mainstream narrative. But other than that, generally speaking, most films do not call attention to their own making. They don't call attention to the camera. The boom mic doesn't appear in the screen. I mean, on the screen in front of you. Um, characters are not talking to the camera. They're not pretending as though there's a director behind the camera. There's a distinct sense of transparency as though you're just slipping into, uh, into this world through this invisible um, screen in front of you. Uh, the other the option of that, the other, the flip side of that is to make a film where you do see the mechanisms of making the movie. Um, and this is where it can become a bit complicated. So in a Godard film, Vendest, this is the movie, The Wind Out of the East, is the movie that um, Peter Wollen is referring to as the best example of what he calls counter cinema. In that movie, you see cameramen. You see the cameraman in a mirror at one point. You see them um, uh, kind of the camera kind of behind the scenes almost looking at the actor doing the acting in front of the director. Almost as though you'd have behind the scenes footage, but it's part of the narratives. It's woven in. It's not a fictional film that's made to feel like a, um, a documentary either. That's also a game that's regularly used, right? Especially in our contemporary filmmaking. It, it seems to be a fairly common thing to have a mockumentary, like a documentary like The Office, for example, where there's a film crew um, and they ask questions on occasion to the characters, et cetera. That's a part of the fictional world. What, what Wallen is suggesting is a filmmaking that, that actually shows you the non-fictional world, like light stands on a on a set for a, 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 a Marvel movie or something, or if you were to see the director walk onto the set of the Marvel movie and, and Ryan, whatever his name is, uh, lift up his mask and they start chatting about, oh, you know, I should have played that scene a little bit differently. And Deadpool's no longer there. Instead, it's Ryan, whatever his name is. Um, that would be this type of trans, of um, a foregrounding, that Peter Wollen is talking about. And of course, it's not something that you're going to see in a mainstream film. Uh, the next one would be the single diegesis and multiple diegesis. That's really complicated. It is also very difficult to explain without giving you some examples. And I don't have any examples to give to you. So I'll skip past that one. Nathaniel? Do you have something to say or? Oh, just... no, sorry. I... Oh, that's not a problem. Not a problem. Um, so uh, closure versus aperture is much easier. So closure and aperture is uh, the idea of closure that you've been talking about on your film analysis, the observations, right? Does the narrative close itself? Does it sum up all of the logical things that's, sprang up in the narrative. Do you get a sense of the story is over? There's a completion to it. Um, there are the that the story is, is, as he has written here, harmonized in its own bounds. Most of the films that you will see in a mainstream setting are those types of films. Lots of closure. Many of the films that you're going to be watching here and many of the films you've seen already have don't have the same type of closure. So M, you could say, yes, Justin, that is somewhat subjective to the viewer. Yes, for sure. Um, M, is, I think, is a good example. We could say M is, has a closure to it because the killer has been caught. And, okay, we don't know what the conclusion of the trial is, but we know that the story for the women is over. I mean, they know who the killer was. Now, they at the same time also open the story again by saying, 
telling us, the audience, you've missed the point. The point is not to punish. The point is to prevent. Um, we will never get our children back. So that does kind of open something up. It leaves us with a feeling of, of the movie having led us to one end and actually kind of tricking us and getting us to that end almost. Um, but most of the movies that you will see are closed. They're, they don't have an openness to them. They don't have intertextuality. They do have parody, and he says that parody is one of those um, things that opens up a movie. And to return again to Deadpool, Deadpool actually is, uh, from the comic book all the way through to the movie, is making fun of the comic book world. It's making fun of the reception of comic books. It's making fun of the heroes in comic books. It's making fun of the entire industry. Now, it is of the industry itself. So you, you could obviously say that's a, almost a strategy to just increase sales effectively. But, um, but as far as the narrative, the narrative does open itself up through these little these, these uh, moments of almost critique of the industry and the simple way that we approach uh, comic book characters, etc. At the end of that movie, though, there's such an immense amount of closure that from that point out, you, you can't really say that movie has any openness to it. I mean, it, it, it follows its own parody into its own paradized ending. It, par it parodies itself and then follows through with doing what it was that it's kind of making fun of. So anyway, um, so there you go. I know that's a complicated explanation, but pleasure versus unpleasure is pretty straightforward. If it's entertaining, it's pleasure. If it is intentionally dissatisfying, then it's unpleasure. And many Godard films are, to some extent, very dissatisfying. Again, I think, as Justin pointed out with the openness, this is also a question of subjectivity on this level of pleasure versus unpleasure. So, you know, I, I've I've seen enough comic book movies that I don't have the pleasure of watching those movies anymore. It's the same movie over and over again, told more poorly each time, I think. Um, so so what that puts me into is is more of a position of being alienated from that movie and more in a position to sit there and and I guess critique it and critique critique its structure. So that is a very subjective experience because most people will watch the film and, and be invigorated by it and be, feel a lot of pleasure from it and, and immerse themselves in it. But the real core here is not to just dislike a movie. The real idea of unpleasure is to be kicked out of the movie as a structure of pleasure, get kicked out of this idea of, of even poss being, it being possible for you to enjoy it and to see it as an object rather than to feel it and immerse yourself in it and get lost in it. Um, so it's more than just not liking it. Uh, it. It's this, it's a, it's a part of the film that kind of talks to you and tells you not to like this, which Godard films will quite often do. And I don't, I don't want to turn you off from Godard, by the way. You will eventually watch Breath, Breathless if you haven't already. And um, that is one of the more coherent films by him. And, and I think many of you may like that film. Um, his films after that become much more difficult to understand as he moves forward. But they still are so rich and important for film history, film as as an object, film as art, that uh, I always encourage you to at least pick up one other one and try to work your way through it. Now, Godard films, too, are very, very influential on famous popular filmmakers, as we have already discussed here. So, uh, okay, so that was pleasure versus unpleasure. And then the final one is fiction versus reality. You know, that's this sense of slipping out of uh, out of the fictional world and slipping into the real life or, you know, slipping in documentary footage into a, a fictional film can fulfill that as well. All of those are subjective 
most of them are. All of them are sliding categories. And it's really about how much does that um, imagery from documentary footage, how much does that push us into thinking something different about the film and how much of it is intended to actually pull us deeper into the film and into the mind of a character or et cetera. Um, but, you know, these are ideas that you can't explore. It's not as though there's a universal truth here in that, in that article. It's something for you to explore on your own. So if you have questions about that, please feel free to type them in here. Um, unmute yourselves if you want and or you know, send me a, an email later. That works too. Garrett, Garrett um, brought up in our, our um, break off session, um, as far as how the lessons are arranged, because in the assignment area, they're one way. In the module area, they're different. They're set up differently. How do you want us to, or which model should we use? You know, the, the um, it's really all the same to me. Uh, you're going to go through this material at any rate. Um, however, whatever order you do it, and and those two modules, this the I, the module that ha that deals with Vertigo and Persona, and the module that deals with Breathless and Agira, the Wrath of God, have since I've started teaching this class continually flip flopped for me as to which one made more sense to watch first. And at this point, I've kind of just given up, and there's a big mixture there. Follow the deadlines for the um, for, or I'm not the deadlines, but the due dates for the material. Stick fairly close to that. Uh, but those due dates are are flexible too. Um, I, I know that doesn't really answer your question, Stanley, but that's that's generally what you should use to guide your way through the material. So um, right now, you should probably for this week be watching Agira and um, Breathless. But if you want to watch Vertigo and Persona, that works for me as well. It, we we end up watching all of them at the, um, by the end of the class anyway. Next week, we'll talk about Vertigo and Persona. Um, I'm sorry. No, next week, we'll talk about Agira, the Wrath of God, and Breathless. Um, but I'll probably also slip in a bit of Vertigo and Persona, too. So if you want to go ahead and watch them, then uh, feel free. Uh, you've watched Vertigo. So, yes, beautiful film. Wonderful. Absolutely amazing film. Um, complete the exam close to the due date. Garrett. So if the due date is on Thursday, I don't, I didn't, is it? Yeah, I think it is on Thursday. Um, I don't know why it would be on Thursday. Should probably have been on Friday. And that was just a date that got confused for me. So flexible due date. If you can get it to me by Thursday, that's fine. In time over the weekend works for me as well. Justin, you had a great question about why would people, why would Godar want people to dislike his work? You know, there is a, um, that's really a good question. Uh, um, there are a lot of people who who definitely do not dislike Godard's work, and they follow him everywhere he goes. Uh, as far as you know, artistically speaking, they'll watch anything he he produces. Um, Quentin Tarantino seems to be one of these people. He's a big fan of Godard as a filmmaker, but he Godard doesn't want he doesn't want people to feel immersed in his stories. It's not so much a matter of disliking it. He doesn't want them to feel as though they lose themselves in the story, as though you're losing yourself to like a heroin addiction or something. And I think that we can see in our contemporary world how addictive these stories can be to some people and how wrapped up they can get in the stories and defending you know, their position and to the extent of attacking people and threatening to kill them on social media if they dare to come up with different interpretations or write different stories, etc. So I think that's what Godard already sees in filmmaking is that type of addiction that can go along with the mainstream narrative. Uh, I don't want to say that that's really what's driving him to, to cause people to dislike it. What he feels is that Cinema can represent something that is truthful. And actually, 
I said that his movies get cr- progressively um, more difficult to understand, but I, and I was really not very nice to him at that point because there's this wonderful film called um, Le Mépris, and in English it is uh, disgust, I think, or disdain, or something like that. Um, which is, it has some of his techniques. So the narrative is a bit fractured. But by the time you reach the end of the movie, you know exactly what happened. You know how the relationship between these two, it fell apart. And what he shows you is the falling apart of the relationship. Um, their behavior isn't necessarily fully rational, but um, but you get to the end of the movie and you know exactly what it was about. Um, you feel you feel as though you've just kind of analyzed their relationship falling apart because you don't really feel that much for the two characters. You don't feel as though one has the right point of view and the other doesn't. You're not put in a position to be a friend of theirs. You're put in a position to be an analyst of them and their relationship. So that type of technique that he has to kind of keep nudging you out of this this immersion in the narrative is important for that particular film. And really for most all of his films, he feels as though cinema can represent truth itself, but only if it does away with the dreamlike fictional, um, if it pierces through it, if it, like I said, prevents the viewer from really immersing themselves in it. Uh, He's an artist, you know, so that's that's what he's after so i hope that helps answer that question it's a very good question and stanley i hope i've i've helped answer your question too even though it wasn't a very good answer right you know you you have to watch all of them at any rate that's not a very good answer i do say on the um on the exam though that you can skip the portion on vertigo since the exam comes along before you would really have watched vertigo if you follow one version of the of the class so feel free to skip it if you've watched vertigo already and you want to do the same analysis that i'm asking you to do in the exam on vertigo feel free i'll consider it for extra credit or i may count if you do a really good job on that one i may you know count it instead of counting one that you may have shortchanged or something remember for the exam detail is important so be careful in how you present it be detailed but not outrageously so. You don't have to talk about every single object that's in the frame for every single one of the 25 times 60 minutes. No, I'm sorry, it's 25 frames per second. So 25 times, uh, each one's about a minute long. So 20 times times 60, 25 times 60, all those frames of film, you don't have to show me everything that's in every single one of those frames. You want to hit on the, the important content, but you want to be detailed about it. So, is everybody comfortable with that so far? I wanted to look at a little bit of floating weeds so that maybe, you know, I could give some some clarity about what you're looking for in the film. Did you, I, I heard some conversation about floating weeds. Seems like many of you had been able to see it. Uh, it is a, uh, it is a film that is, I would say not Ozu's greatest film. This is this doesn't fit on a list of the greatest films Ozu, the director, has ever made. Um, but every single one of his films is on a list somewhere of the greatest films ever made, I swear. Many of his films fit onto it. So while Floating Weeds is not the be-all, end-all, the be-all, end-all of his film career would probably be Tokyo Story, and Tokyo Story is in black and white, and I really wanted a color film. And I, th- I personally think this is one of his better color films. And it's also a film that involves, it has a little bit of comedy, whereas some of his other color films are, you know, they're not dour, they're not sad, but they're, they don't have the same type of comedy that you see here. So it just felt like it was a, would be a good relaxing movie to watch before we get into some more serious films. So... Floating Weeds is Japanese. I guess you all picked up on that. It is by the director Ozu, one of the um, greatest directors to ever live, and, and a director who has a particular style that is um, that is unique. So let's take a 
Let's take a gander at some of these things. Share the tab where I have it open. Now, don't forget that you have access to all of these movies from Floating Weeds Up, from Floating Weeds On, except for Sunset Boulevard, uh, in the assignment section of Canvas. So you can get to every single one of them there. Quality of the films that are up there, the, the quality of the version that you see may not be the best, but it's watchable. And actually, Floating Weeds ended up transferring pretty well. So, one of the first things to note about Ozu is something that is called a. Well, let me let me ask you. I'll flip back over here. Do you know what this type of matching is called? So we've we've talked about eye line match. Eye line match is where you edit from the face of someone looking at something to an object, then back to the face. And you've seen, generally speaking, the angle of the camera looking at the object is roughly equivalent to the angle that the person would be looking at the object. So if they're looking at something on the ground, the angle of the object will be a high angle. If they're looking at something up in the sky, the angle will be a low angle. Now, if you've watched Vertigo, you have already seen a bit of a playing around with that angle and that eye line match idea in the image or the scene where Johnny, um, the, the cop guy, steps up on that step stool. And as he takes the first step, we look at him from a low angle. He takes the next step. We look at him from the low angle as though we're looking from the eyes of the woman who's with him. Then he takes a step to the top step and the camera looks at him eye level. And that's when things begin to fall apart for him. Beautifully shot. This here, I see no one has taken a gander. No one's taken a guess. This is called a graphical match. The image that you see in the center, the lighthouse, is graphically matched to the image of the empty bottle. And that that's, that's an internal graphical match. There's a graphical match also across the edits in that the lighthouse is going to follow, we, we're going to follow the lighthouse as he edits us closer into the village as the film plays out here. So you notice the lighthouse there in the middle. There's the lighthouse. There's the lighthouse. And the first introduction of another aesthetic component to Ozu's films. Ozu was a filmmaker who, once he started making color films, would actually take a color wheel and determine what colors he wanted in his film. He made the film, before he even started writing the narrative quite often, he would determine what the palette was for the film. This particular film, if you did not pick up on it, every single shot from here on out, except for a couple of different shots, every single one has some red in it somewhere. So you have the red post box here. You have the red poster, the red whatever that is. You have the red tags in the back. And that's going to go all the way through the film. The red flowers that are outside of the, um, of the apartment of the, uh, of, the, uh, of the woman that the master, I can't really remember his name, but I just call him the master. That's what they call him. Um, his lover with whom he has a child uh, in her little apartment or her house right outside of the window there, those red flowers that, that uh, Ozu returns to over and over and over again. Um, 
You'll also notice that the camera will always sit at roughly eye level with someone who is seated. And so it's always looking up just slightly, almost always looking up just slightly at the faces of the characters. Um, that's because his camera was, he used one camera setup and everything got framed in that setup. He also at no point pans, tilts, does anything with the camera once it's set up. The camera is very static. No movement. So you'll see that we're closer to this guy here now, um, but we're still at a lower angle than he is, uh, because generally speaking, that camera looks down up. Hollywood film being played. Now, you may not know much about the um, type of theater this is, but this is Kabuki theater. Uh, yes, Stanley, it is a mid-range shot. So most of the shots are mid-range, meaning we're not very close to the characters and we're not very far away from them, midway. Um, Ozu does use close-ups, especially in conversation. But he rarely uses a real, what we would call a real close-up, where we just have the face. More often than not, we have the shoulders, the head, and then a bit of space above the head. Um, it is very, very rare. I don't think anywhere in this film we have a real close-up where the face takes up the entire image. Instead, we generally have either a mid-range shot or a, a closer shot. Uh, to see their, their portrait, the, the bust of the person, effectively. But to the idea of the Kabuki theater, you, you may or may not know much about it, but at this point, post-World War II, it was considered to be old-fashioned. And that narrative of this old-fashioned versus the modern is one of the subtle little threads that runs through here, especially when it comes to the conflict between the father and the son. The war itself is mentioned once, and that is right close at the beginning, when they're having the conversation with the uh, owner uh, or their patron, I should say, who has come to see them. And actually that is a spot that I want to move to here so that we can see another unique aspect. You'll notice that the conversations are filmed straight on. The camera is looking directly at the people who are speaking. And then the camera flips 180 degrees and looks directly at the other person who is speaking. That has a number of effects. Oh, yes, Stanley, you're absolutely right. See, you can see it here. There's these frames back here. Uh, so his head is almost kind of framed inside of this window. There are, are plenty, and this is a standard aspect of Ozu's filmmaking. You see a lot of hallways or doorways and people walking across in front of the doorway well in the distance in front of you. So a long distance shot at the end of the shot is that frame or the doorway with people walking in front of it. He does that over and over and over again in every single film he makes in the color period at any rate. And it's also in a number of his black and white films. Um, but this face, this straight on conversation technique is completely unique to Ozu. I don't even think any other Japanese directors use this. It is a bit disconcerting um, because we're just not used to that. But I think it creates a certain intimacy with the people who are speaking. It's almost as though they are speaking to us. And when we come to the some of the characters who don't have any real presence in the film, 
for example, this guy right here, who is their manager, who's going to go off to the other town to try to set up a, um, a deal so they can um, go to a theater in another town and, and, um, and do their little show. And he, he never comes back. He disappears. So this is the only time he is in the film. He is such a minor character. Um, and yet he is filmed in exactly the same way. So not only is there a type of intimacy that's created in these conversations, even though it can be a bit off-putting, there's also a deep humanity. And that humanism is something that infuses all of Ozu's films. The characters feel very human and the director treats them as human beings. Uh, he treats them with a type of dignity that you simply don't get in many other directors. Uh, and it is something that contemporary directors regularly turn to Ozu to try to, to tap into that um, humanity, uh, that, that visualization of this type of humanism, um, and, and be inspired by him. So now that's not everything for the film. That's not the entirety of the film. We've looked at a couple of scenes, but... Um, but I'll allow you to go finish watching it and, and we'll open up this discussion on Monday. I mean, I'm sorry, on Tuesday of next week, we will also talk a little bit more about Woolen if you want to, and uh, about Vertigo and Persona, um, Agira and Breathless all mixed together. Wonderful films. These are some of my personal favorite films. So, yeah, I mean, that doesn't mean that you have to like them, but uh, makes for a, for good discussion, I think, the films that are coming up. So I hope you enjoy them. I know you've got the exam to do, so, you know, enjoyment may be stretching it a bit. Um, definitely work on the exam. Email me any questions you have. Perfectly happy to help as best I can. Um, try to keep up with the reading once you get your textbooks and everything and try to decipher some of the some of the things that are in there. They will figure fairly prominently on the second exam. And what else? Um, that's about it. Don't forget your film observations. Turn them in. And we will keep working on. I'm done for the evening. I hope all of you have a lovely evening, a lovely week. Send me any questions you have. And you can feel free to chat here, too. I'm not going to run away from the computer. Thank you, Garrett. Good evening. Thank you too, Justin. Bye-bye. Have a great evening, Stanley. Bye, Charles. You too, Jalon. Ciao. Au revoir. You are currently the only person in this conference.